Angel is brought to you by Salesforce Essentials. Jumpstart sales and support by leveraging the world's number one CRM at a startup price point of just $25 a month per user. Go to salesforce.com slash angel for an additional 50% off and a free onboarding call. And LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn as the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash angel to get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Angel, the podcast. This is the podcast that goes with my book. You can buy the book, Angel thebook.com, the podcast Angel can be found at Angel Podcast. If you do a search for Angel on your favorite podcast player, you will get podcasts about angels in our lives, the religious ones. It has nothing to do with angel investing. So <laughs> or if is you, it? Or is it? Who knows? <laughs> but if you do a search for Angel Calacanis, you will find this podcast, but you can go to Angel Podcast and get all the links to your popular players. Uh, today on the program, one of my favorite humans, and a fantastic product designer and a fantastic investor, Mr. Dave Morin, is back on the program. I don't know when you were last on This Week in Startups, but years ago. I think it was during PATH. So it must have during been. During PATH. Yeah, wow. It must have been six, seven, maybe even eight, eight years ago. It is so incredible the legacy of PATH. Uh, for people who don't know, you were famous for being part of the team that helped build Facebook. Yeah. And you were there from years. 2006 until 2010. So pre public. Yeah. Maybe you were employee fifty, or yeah, it's. I'm not actually sure what the number is. Um, I did an interview. What office were you in? The first one. Um, I did an interview recently, and CNN found number twenty nine. I don't oh, wow. think that's accurate. I think it's later than that. But you know, was this first, the office first hundred in, for sure on University Avenue? Or? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What was it like in, when there were fifty or less people at Facebook? Um, I mean, it How was. How would you describe the atmosphere? Electric. Huh. Yeah. Um, Anything's possible? Yeah, there was sort of a sense of, um, I mean, it's interesting because we were actually quite small um, in the in context. You yeah. know, we had a few million users. Um, and, you know, at the time that was actually a lot. And, uh, but in the grand scheme of today, it's nothing. But yeah. um, we were only working on college campuses back then. And so our market was the 10 million college students that, uh, you know, go to college in the United States. And so right. we had like half the market and we were right. very excited to have half the market. Halfway and, there. Yeah. And we didn't think of it as um, like a, you know, I think we had these grand ambitions, like maybe we could change the world, but it was very much like that was like a mid twenties group of mid twenties kids in an office yeah. above a, you know, restaurant in Palo Alto. Um, and so, you know, there was kind of this frenetic youth, you know, energy of the 25 year old sets of, well, Mark was 19. Um, That's you know. crazy. Mark was 19 years yeah. old. Yeah. How would you describe him at that age? I mean, he was a kid obviously, but he's super mature, right? Yeah. You mean now or well, back no, then? then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, back then, certainly. I mean, Mark's always been one of the smartest people that I've ever met in my entire life. And Smart that, that hasn't like, changed, you quick, know. Quick, like like very easy to process stuff or book smart? How would you describe his genius? Um, or would you describe it as genius or just super focused? How would you describe it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of book smart. You know, he's very well studied and read, but um, also like incredible um, sort of foresight, forward mm -hmm. thinking, um, but in a way that is uncommon you know you don't meet many people where you truly believe there are three to four steps you know you, you hear yeah. this about chess masters right yeah. they can see three three steps ahead mark like was always playing multi-dimensional chess and right. you know could see it was like he could see the whole board um and think through all the different options and it was so it wasn't just processing information quickly it was like you know an, an ability to kind of like see the whole game in a way that most people don't. Um, obviously, also technically gifted. I mean, it's- He could you, write code. Yeah, you don't run into many founders that can do both, right? right. Um, and then I think there's also this thing which, you know, he's enormously um, determined. His determination and competitive will is, I think, I think it's empirically proven at this point. Is, yeah, is um, arguably best in the world. And so I, just an enormous competitor. 
preternatural. Preternatural is that the word? Preternatural. Preternatural, I think, is the word. Like, really? it it means like just above like the normal human condition. I think. Yeah, I mean, he he kind of is almost like a world class athlete in a way. Yeah. Like, there's this um, drive and un kind of like unlimited energy that's yeah. pretty amazing, um, and that's pretty cool. I guess the other thing I would say is a lot of people don't know this, but Mark has a really big heart and he's huh. actually like a, I've always viewed it that he, his heart's generally in the right place. And like, you know, most people don't see that side of him. Mm. I think it's cool that he's talking a lot more in public this year. Um, yeah. He's doing a podcast in fact. Yeah. And I think that's good because my experience of working with him was that he always made you better, you know, and you know, I've, I've worked with, leaders of different kinds. And Mark was one of those people who, when you would go to him for feedback or to do a product review or something, sometimes they were difficult, but more often than not, you would spend like a really long time debating things, mm. right? Like, and you would leave either that conversation or a series of 10 or I don't know, a hundred conversations over an entire year, having thought through every single possible way to think about something. And I don't know, you hear that you don't hear that about a lot of leaders. You hear yeah. that they just tell you what to do and like that's Yeah, it, Steve you know? Jobsian like maybe comes down from God. Who knows if yeah. that's true too because these people forget these companies are filled with humans yeah. and then this mythology starts. The person tends to clam up and maybe get on the defensive, circle the wagons, people around them don't talk. Yeah. That seems to have happened to Zuck as well. Like he kind of clammed up a little bit, like not talking to the public and then it leads to everybody to question, what is his motivation? Yeah, and I think that- What one drives him? One yeah. of the things that I try to say, and um, having done a couple of podcasts recently, is that Facebook's a difficult company and it's a difficult brand. And the reason why is that it's human. It's, mm. you know, what is Facebook? Facebook is this like map of all of humanity and all of its connections and all of the interactions between all of those humans. And yeah. we're good, all- Good, bad, and in yeah, between. Yeah, and we're all human, and we all know that we uh, do good things, we do bad things, we make mistakes. We, Every one of us is making mistakes, like even with the people closest to us in our right. lives. Every single day you miscommunicate, right? right? And so here you are sitting at the center of a system where it's just like full of humans trying to communicate with each other. Yeah. And so the brand is always, I think, going to feel very flawed because of that. Yeah, it's and human. Tw and Twitter has that as well, right? Yeah, Twitter absolutely. has it as well where, you know, you want people to have freedom of speech. Yeah. You want certain people to have anonymity because they might need it and you want free expression. But with these systems at scale, it seems they always tend to break down. So, given your experience with Path, Twitter being a user and having helped build Facebook, two of the you know top five most legendary social products in the world, do you think the world should be connected or do you think groups of people should be connected? Because it seems like Zuckerberg now is saying, you know what, maybe everybody should kind of be connected, but maybe we should break people into smaller groups and that would be more manageable. How do you think about it? Because you seem to have this Dunbar number, 50 person, 100 person limit was your spin on path yeah. and now zuckerberg five years later is copying you again he's really <laughs> studies your approach and i don't mean that to deride him yeah. more as a compliment to you yeah do you think that connecting everybody is a good idea now that we're in year 15 of that experiment i think that just like i just said this is very human one of the stories that i always like to tell is that in 2006 um, we had this problem where the narrative in the public was, oh, if you join Facebook and you post the wrong thing, um, you might get fired because yeah. there were all of these people that were getting fired. And yeah. anybody that was around the internet business back then remembers this narrative. Like there, yeah. were, there were people getting fired and it was almost always for having a photo of you drinking a beer on yeah. the weekend. And this went on for like six months or a year. And then after a year, I don't know how long the actual time period is, but it was some period of time, um, more and more people started having photos of themselves, not just hanging out with their family or their friends, but having fun on the weekends mm. and going to Las Vegas or going and golfing or whatever. And strangely, what started to happen is the norm shifted. 
everyone started to realize, oh, everybody drinks on the weekends yeah. with their friends, right? Yeah. And it it was this strange thing where like suddenly the 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 norm shifted. And so the system had to start to account for that, right? Or maybe it didn't at all. It just did its thing and changed the norm. And so, okay, like yeah. now people don't care that, you know, people yeah. have a photo drinking. And so you see this kind of play out over and over in the Facebook story, um, whether it was the very beginning um, when Mark started it, you know, the his first product at um, Harvard was this product called, I think it was called Face Mash or something. And if you look yeah. at the original article from launching Facebook at Harvard, he literally says, um, I got in trouble for launching this other thing. They told me that it needed to have this, you know, this list of privacy things. So I built those in and launched this new thing. Yeah. And that's kind of the story like forever with yeah. Facebook is like society uses whatever the current tool set is. And then some norms change, some don't. And then things need to evolve in the system. And so Facebook's been pretty good, I think, at like hearing that feedback and then making the necessary changes. So your question is more like, well, where are we now? Yeah. I mean, I think it's good that the world is connected to, you know, a network. It, yeah. it's, it's kind of amazing that you can, I could like pick this phone up right now and post a tweet and who knows, it could end up in every country in the world, like, or no one, right? right? Like, that's like kind of amazing. And that's the case for anyone with a mobile phone. Yeah. Like that was impossible 20 years ago, right? And you had to have like this equipment or something to yeah. get a message out, right? So- Broadcast studio. That's really positive. Satellites, yeah. But, um, and I think we've done a lot of experiments and I mean, you and I have invested in yeah. or built. Yeah. It's it's almost hard to catalog the number of use cases that we've tried to build that are social in nature on the internet. And some of them got really big. Some of them didn't work out at all. Yeah. Um, some of them became the ones that carried these networks to like the scale that they're at. Um, and then they get to that size and they need to add new use cases. And so where are we now? I don't know. I think that in a lot of ways, a lot of these use cases that everybody's talking about today are already around, right? Mm. Like Facebook groups is one of the largest products on the internet. Nobody really talks about it that way, but I think right. there's, I mean, you can look in their it's crazy. Uh, filings. I mean, it's like, I think there's north of a couple billion and a half people using various Facebook groups. And it's not like they just built that product, you know, today or right. because Mark, you know, has shifted the strategy, like that product's always been around. Um, mm. And same goes for all these messaging apps and things like this. Um, I think there's a lot more nuance to this than yeah. people are talking about right now. And for example, I saw that last week or two weeks ago, Facebook did a developers conference and they talked about how they're testing removing likes from Instagram in Canada. Hmm. To me, that's the kind of stuff that's the most interesting. Like we can get into privacy and security. Like these are different things. There's hmm. There's security, meaning what technology literally secures the connection between your phone and the other phones and the servers. That's one question. Then there's questions of privacy, like who owns the data? Do you own the data? Can you move your data? There's all these data questions. But then there's this like more nuanced level, which is like, what is the actual implementation of the product? And what are the details, right? Like when you like something, who can see that you liked something? If you like something, does a push notification happen? You know, there's all these sort of this like kind of behavioral nuance. nuance. Yeah, yeah, this nuance. Like I guess you they call and I are interacting. Yeah, yeah, you and I are interacting right now. You're yeah. nodding or not nodding. Yeah. Thinking so about it, we're, we're raising my of, eyebrow. And there's these things that go on, I think, in these social networks where there's there's feedback loops and then there's these signals that get sent out, like that really do affect the way that you think about what you're posting into here or mm. who's in the room with me. You know, like yeah. if you and I weren't alone or if we didn't have a live stream, we might yeah. behave differently. Right? Sure. And so that's a thing I think about these networks, which we don't really, you don't see that talked about at all in the big public narratives, right? Like, yeah. oh, should Facebook turn off the ability to see who your friends are yeah. on the profile right. or, right. you know, those things. When we get back from this quick commercial, Let's get to brass tacks. We're both parents. What do you think about letting your kids yeah. into the things that, let's face it, you created in the world or help create? Sure. Do you want your kids to embrace this social and online uh, world when we get back on Angel? 
Scaling sales is so hard. You know that, but it's so essential. You need to scale your sales process, your team, and of course your software. You know Salesforce is the world's number one customer relationship management platform also known as CRM. And now with Salesforce Essentials, you get easy, out-of-the-box tools and support at a startup price point, and that's critical. Here are the benefits. You're gonna get set up instantly, and you can easily scale your sales team by customizing with clicks. You don't need to write any code. You will get simple integrations that connect and integrate all of your data under one roof. And you'll have full cycle customer support. So you can automatically connect multiple support channels. You'll be able to automate busy work and repetitive tasks so you're not wasting your time. And customers can help themselves, of course, with a self-service support site. Everything you need is on one screen so you can track emails, calls, and meetings from your inbox. Get access to the world's number one CRM at a cost fit for a startup. Go to salesforce.com slash angel and you will get a 50% discount with an annual contract and you'll get a free onboard training session. So go to salesforce.com slash angel and get that 50% discount right now. Welcome back to Angel the Podcast. My guest today is Dave Morin, and we're not going to talk about Facebook the entire episode, but having Dave here, one of the earliest architects of Facebook, and not talking to him about Facebook and Path would be um, a huge omission on my part. So we're going to do another uh, couple of minutes about talking about Happy Facebook before we go into your unbelievable list of investments, <laughs> Allbirds, Twitter, Venmo, Nest, Robinhood, Airtable, Pinterest, Postmates, Stripe, my lord. What a collection of investments uh, that you've made uh, yourself as an angel and with slow ventures. So um, when we left our hero, that's you, on the break, <laughs> I'm curious, you know, Chamath says doesn't let his kids anywhere near it. Sean Parker, uh, very vocal about, hey, we built these things to be addicting and they're too addicting. Chris Hughes, the co-founder and roommate of Zuckerberg, saying, break up Facebook. And the WhatsApp founders, one of them saying you should delete Facebook. And the Instagram founders leaving in a huff over how Instagram was being architected, I think, or being treated. We don't know the full story there yet. But anyway, there's a collection of people who helped build the, the product and who are looking at it now saying, to varying degrees, uh, maybe this is Frankenstein or maybe this needs to be rethought. How do you think about it when you think about your kids, uh, my kids, our kids, uh, embracing this future? Do you want them on social media? Do you think it needs to be tweaked a bit before they should go on it? This is when the rubber hits the road, right? I mean, yeah. You, you know, like your kids get, get a phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I've spent the last, uh, since I sold Path, um, the primary project that I've been working on is called Sunrise. Mm. And um, it's a nonprofit initiative, um, which is focused on trying to find cures for depression mm. and all forms of mental health. And so through the process of working on that, um, you know, I've came across a lot of uh, science that I didn't know. And I've, yeah. I've helped uh, make some great science happen. Um, and, um, but one of the things that I started to learn about pretty early on, you know, this was around maybe 2015, 2016 was the burden, um, or burden maybe is the wrong way to put it, but the, the true tax that social media and the internet, I, I think are having on not just our brains, but the brains of our kids. And you yeah, know, I mean, it's a real thing. And I don't think you can. I don't think I could come on here and pretend like it's not um, yeah. or say that I don't feel responsibility um, to think about it, try to improve the, the at least the conversation, if not, you know, the implementation of some of these things. Um, We've well, created an organization to help with the issue. So obviously you care deeply about yeah. depression yeah. and people getting out of it. And the studies have shown yeah. that this can make people anxious. Yeah. And in fact, anxiety and depression are correlated yeah. and also make people depressed. So yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. I don't think anybody created social networks, whether it was MySpace or LinkedIn or Facebook or Path, to create anxiety in the world. They yeah. created it with good intention. Yeah. But there is a, a cost to it, which is anxiety. No question. What do you think is causing the anxiety? Is it the FOMO? Is it the constant interruptions and the screen time? 
What do you, what is your best guess as to it, and how does it affect you personally? How how have you personally, Dave, managed your own usage of the technology? Sure. Have you slowed it down? Do you look at your you know, amount of posting and th- try to contextualize it and, and reduce it? Yeah, I mean, I've I've really uh, taken, I guess I could answer those in reverse order. Yeah. I mean, my own personal um, configuration, I guess, of my phone, one of the key things that I tell everyone is to turn off all notifications except for your core communications, like phone and your maybe one texting app that's like yeah. your main one. Um, mostly so that you're on offense and not defense, right? Like right. if you let the phone get your attention rather than you controlling your own attention, then you're always on defense. And that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of a bummer. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I also don't have any social apps on my first page. I put them in a folder on the second page. Ah. Um, that's like a simple solution. There's some social apps that I just don't even have on my phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, everyone's personal. I tend to not be fundamentalist about this. I don't really believe in fundamentalisms in general, yeah. um, because if you ch- take a fundamentalist position in anything, then it sort of takes over your mind and becomes this thing that you're focused so on. So you're not quitting Facebook, deleting yeah. Twitter, yeah. and deleting your account. Yeah. But yeah, put it on the second page. I, I removed my social accounts and put a Google Doc in my tray uh, and Slack when I was writing the book, because I said, you know what? I, my companies need me. Yeah. And my book and my audience needs me to yep. finish this goddamn book. Yep. And I wrote the book in 19 days. Yep. The primary writing of yep. it was 19 days because yep. I realized I was spending an hour to two hours on varying degrees of social and messaging apps. Yeah. And when I recaptured that, oh my Lord. And the book is such a great joy for me to look at and see it in Chinese and see it in Japanese and have people stop me on the street that it's hard for me to stop using Twitter because I'm addicted to that. Yeah. But the long-term benefit of having that book in the world feels so much better to me than my daily Twitter. But I haven't figured out how to fundamentally change it. I could be Daniel Steele if I deleted my Twitter account. Yeah. I don't think that anybody has a good answer to this, right? Because, and this, I guess, is maybe my more... um, uh, nuanced answer to your question, which is that my perspective on this is like, well, is that, you know, you ask these questions, is this good for the world? Like, do you let your kids, are you going to take a fundamentalist position on it? Um, I have much more of a, I guess, transcend and include kind of, uh, notion on this, which is that, look, we're here now, right? Like we created the internet and we even created Wi-Fi. Like one of the things that I think about a lot is that social media and gets almost too much of the burden of the of the hate. Um, yeah. When there's places that I go, like I grew up in Montana, I like to go skiing in backcountry. Yeah, I'm like a outdoorsman, and there's places you can go and there's no internet, right? Yeah, um, that I, solves a social problem. There's some lodges that I know of that have no internet, and it's actually got me thinking like. Wow, like, did you know that the FCC makes it illegal to block Wi Fi? Yeah. And that's kind of a strange thing when you think about it. It's like, well, I've seen this. You take Wi Fi out of the equation and everyone's super social and hanging out with each other. And they love it. Yeah. And it's like it's incredible burden's been lifted. Yeah. And, but you can't block it, which is like a really interesting thing. And so is it, is it just social media's responsibility? Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's like one thing. I think that, um, you know, I really think that if you look at history, right, when we shifted from the uh, uh, working a lot with our bodies and farms and sort of the industrial age, post-World War II, and we shifted into working in office buildings, um, the notion of of a gym did not exist in the first half of the century. And the gym became a thing after we all started working in offices and we were working in our brains, not our bodies anymore. And so you needed a gym. If you look at the numbers last year and, you know, you've got the Calm book over there and we talked about Calm earlier. Calm's now worth a billion dollars. Meditation apps were actually the most popular category in the app store last year. Why is that happening? You know, why is the Juul cigarette the most popular thing for youth in the country? Well, you've got this new technology called the internet and on it is these social media ecosystems and they take all of our attention and um, no matter what the business model they just you spend a lot of your time in there they're addicting and there's a lot of social signaling going on and so you get anxious you get depressed you fomo all kinds of things right and so that creates a set of feelings that 
we don't have the tools to deal with and we don't have the structures in society to deal with. Mm. And so what's happening? Well, you have soul cycle spreading all over the country. You've got meditation apps in the app store, the biggest category, you know, people, you've got cannabis legalizing across the country. Yeah, self-medicating, yeah. Yeah, and so these tools are starting to appear yeah. that help balance out this new technology, right? Because, you know, you can really get, I think, negative about like, well, the technology is causing all these problems and those are important, yes. But you can also look on the other side and say, wow, like LGBTQ rights like moved forward faster than like, I think it would have ever moved forward if we were still in the mass media age, right? Yeah. I've seen this happen with depression and anxiety. When I first started working on the project, I didn't want to talk to anybody publicly that yeah. I'm doing this. Like, um, you know. Did you feel a sense of shame or or people would judge you differently? Because I assume that you started this because you have some level of depression or anxiety. Yeah. I mean, I I think that like I felt whether it was rational or not, there's a stigma yeah. out there and yeah, maybe people think of me differently or, you know, and then I started working on it and every single entrepreneur that I sat down with told me their story of dealing with depression or going through this horrible time or yeah. being suicidal, you know, and, and I started to realize, wow, not only am I not alone, I'm really not alone, right? No, um, it seems to over-index in here. founders. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Like we could really get into this, but- And we will. This is kind of a, you know, it's a very real thing. And um, and so that stigma, I mean, just in the last four years has like so rapidly changed. And I don't think you could account it to anything other than social media. Absolutely. When stigma, people right? are willing to go on social media and say, uh, listen, I'm suffering from depression. I have anxiety. I'm in pain. Yeah. It's hard for me to get out of bed in the morning or do what I do. And people are like, but you're rich and powerful and you're in the NBA, right? Yeah. Like, um, who's the cat who played with LeBron James in Cleveland? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was an amazing voice. He wrote yeah, a whole Michael article Phelps, about it, or yeah, Michael Phelps, yeah. and you're like, wow, this great Olympian or this incredible yeah. basketball player, these people have money and power yeah. and celebrity, and they're depressed? How is it possible? And yeah. people start to realize that it is not correlated with your success in life. I funded this movie, um, or it's a documentary. It's not out yet, but it's called The Weight of Gold, and um it's it's really unbelievable. I mean, the, is it the, about Phelps? It's well, Phelps is one of the executive producers, oh, but um, unbelievable number of Olympic athletes that uh, did enormous number of interviews talking about depression, wow. suicide. I mean, just the fact that when you've spent your whole life working out every single day, and then you get to winning the gold, and then you're famous for like a week, wow, and then it's gone. Postpartum, like of a level. Yeah. You either loved the actual sort of struggle to get there or right. you didn't. You were only focused on the gold. So when you hit that moment and then there was nothing after it, yeah. life means nothing. Yeah. Versus the some of them really love actually the struggle part. And they're like, no, what everything's cool. Yeah. You know? And so there's a yeah, it doesn't matter what type of athlete you are or yeah. whether you're an entrepreneur, so you know, high performer, the risk is just enormously high. It's so interesting. I used to run marathons and I always had post New York City Marathon depression. Makes and I'm not total a, sense. And, and I don't have like, I'm not an anxious or depressed person, um, but I remember acutely, I would be very sad on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because I'd be like, this, this is over. All that training, it's gone. Yeah. And I have the medal. I just sit what there now? and look at the medal yeah. and say, what now? Yeah. And then eventually I started to realize, well, I could have run the Hawaiian <laughs> or yeah. the Boston Marathon, totally. or I could cherish the journey and the enjoyment of doing the 12, the 15, yeah. the 18 mile runs. Yeah. And it, it was not final and I, I was able to process it, but I do remember one of the few times I felt depression in my life. Yeah. And then after 9-11, I had PTSD very strongly, but undiagnosed. Yeah. And I had to get treated for it. It took me like two or three years that I needed to get treated for it. I don't think I've ever told the story here, but I used to just cry when I would hear an ambulance sometimes. Yeah. I'd have to like excuse myself. It makes total because sense. I would, I would get triggered. I'd think about people falling yeah. out of the building. Yep. And that's me, yeah. Jason Calacanis. Like, yeah. I'm a strong guy. Like, I can handle it. That's a real thing. I mean, but that is a real thing. When you there see- There were people that weren't in New York that feel that way, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. No, I can't see... even imagine being there, honestly. Well, and then if you have a brother who's a firefighter and your grandfather was a firefighter, it hits very close to home when totally. your brother is calling you. Because my brother would call me and say, oh, how how is your day? And he'd say, oh, I I, uh, I was in the- He's in the honor gar guard. He's like, yeah, I had two honor guards today. I had three honor guards today. I was uh, like- he would go to Queens, to Staten Island, to Brooklyn, 10 a.m., so 1 p.m., 4 p.m., just to have 100 firefighters line up for another funeral. It was uh, brutal. It's gnarly. Well, 
when we get back from this quick break, I want to talk to you about what what are the ways founders can get help? Because since we're here at this moment, I think this is a unique opportunity for us to talk about how founders can get help when they're feeling this, especially from their investors and angels yeah. who have been through it before when we get back on Angel. Hiring is always hard and it's getting really hard today because we've got unemployment at historic lows. Also, many people just throw a job posting out there. They put it on their job board or some random message board or dump it in your Slack room. That's not going to work. It's not going to work. But what is going to work is to go ahead and use LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where 610 million members visit and they do that to make connections, learn and grow as professionals. And sometimes they're looking to discover new job opportunities or sometimes they're passive job seekers. And that is the secret. Not everybody's going to a job board every day looking for jobs, but LinkedIn will present opportunities to those hundreds of millions of LinkedIn users. And here's how easy it is. You just simply go to LinkedIn and it's really easy because you say where you're looking for the person, you put in your job, you can then look for what experiences you want them to have. How many years of marketing, you set a budget, boom, it's up and running and you will find somebody quickly. How do I know this? Because we found two of our 15 team members on LinkedIn very recently, Sir Charles, our new director, and our marketing manager, Maureen. You can create these job listings quickly and easily and to get $50 off right now, a fitty, okay? 5-0 for your first job posting. Go to linkedin.com slash angel, A-N-G-E-L. You know how to spell angel. That's linkedin.com slash angel and you will get $50 off your first job posting. Terms and conditions apply, of course. Now, let's get back to this amazing podcast. All right, welcome back to Angel, the podcast where we talk about angel investing, but we spent the first 25 minutes of this podcast talking with my good friend, Dave Morin, um, about Facebook, social media, the internet, anxiety, depression, my PTSD, his anxiety and depression, and how to contend with it. And we're going to get into the angel investing part, and you're really in for a treat because it's very rare to have somebody on the podcast who is as good or better of an investor than I am. And this is one of those few instances, Robinhood, Twitter, Pinterest, Blue Bottle, Slack, Stripe, Postmates, Venmo, Airbnb, Dropbox, Wealthfront, Quora, Casper, Airtable, Earl Birds, and he's on the board of Eventbrite, which recently went public. Congratulations on that. Thank you. You and I deal with founders who are uh, calling us on the phone. I had one call me one day crying in the shower and said, I just puked. And I said, where are you? He said, I'm in my bathroom. I said, where's your family? And he said, downstairs waiting in the car and I can't move. Yeah. And I said, you know what? We could shut this company down, get you a job somewhere, and then in two years start another one. Yep. It's just a video game. We can put another quarter in and hit the reset button. Don't worry about it. I'll back you yeah. for the next three companies. You're a yep. winner in my book. Yep. But it was one of the most shocking experiences to me because I had given everybody this speech after seeing um, the founder of um, Ecomom killed himself, sadly. Oh, yeah. Uh, Forgot about Jody yeah, Sherman. Yeah. And then um, the founder of uh, Austin Hines from Cambrian Analytica, Cambrian not Analytica, Sciences or something Cambrian like that. Cambrian Sciences. Yeah. Both of them have been on the po- genetics. Yeah. yeah, both of them had been on the podcast. Um, oh wow! Yeah, well, when you think about it, if you have a thousand people on your podcast, which is what we've had yep. after ten years, over no a thousand, question. you're going to have two people. Actually, if you think about it, one in 500 would be way, way higher indexing than in America. Is it one in 100,000 or something suicide rate? Jackie, yeah. look it up. Um, Austin Hines, yeah. Um, what should they do? When you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling anxiety, what have you learned for you, for people you work with, is the right thing to do? I think number one, you should have a coach. Yeah. Um, number one, yeah. like out of the gate. If you're a founder, you need to treat yourself like a Olympic athlete. Mm. Um, and you know, an athlete, whether you're a warriors athlete yeah. or a, you know, a, a Olympic athlete that's solo uh, sports, you don't go into it without a coach, right? Mm. Um, and some kind of infrastructure that's helping to not, n- not, not just like make sure that you're like sort of okay, but they're mm. like actually actively in the game with you and mm. trying to help you make sure that you're. Um, 
performing at a high level, but also helping you understand like, this is really hard, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you actually talk to professional athletes, they've got meditation coaches and yoga coaches and a masseuse, a masseuse nutritionist. And, and nutrition and cold, yeah. cold plunges. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Right. And so I think founders need to take it a lot more seriously that mm -hmm. their health is number one. Right. Um, we've kind of got this culture where, we give people an enormous amount of money, you know, fill their uh, company's bank account with millions of dollars. They've never managed that before. That's an instant pressure cooker on top of, you know, the narratives and the people mm. sort of barking at you every day about success and yada, yada. And so I think you need to have a therapist or a coach, you know, somebody who's really trained in this stuff. Like that's number one. Um, and so that's like your preventative medicine, mm. right? Um, and then when things actually get really hard, I mean, ideally you've got people either on your board or angel investors like you and me that are people that you can call and actually be honest with. Um, I've always tried to be that person um, yeah. around the founders that I'm with, you know, and named Slow Ventures, Slow Ventures for that reason. Um, yeah, take it easy. There's no rush here. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I always tell people like when you're starting a company, you better be ready to spend 10 years and 10,000 lunch and dinners um, talking about the same thing. So yeah. it's going to be a really long journey, right? Yeah. Pace and, yourself. Yeah, I mean, look what Uber just went public. Like yeah. we both were in those rooms, yeah. right? Like at, 10 years. 10 years ago, I think it was your dinner that like open a lot Angel of us Forum. met them, right? Yeah. And Oh, you were there for the yeah. Open Angel Forum that time? I was time? there that wow. night. Wow, yeah. but you didn't invest or you did? You oh, didn't. don't even get me started on the Uber wow. story. I was in the Go ahead, I we're was, started now. <laughs> I was in the Airbnb with Travis and Garrett and Melody oh, in no. Paris. You're kidding. Not joking. And you passed. Uh, see, that I have a similar story because I wasn't an angel investor. Were you angel investing actively back then? No, see, that's the thing. So I, I didn't start till late 09 and I was yeah. broke. I was full out broke in yeah. 08. And I, I literally, I looked up the email on the IPO day and I was like, yep. I literally, I have this email with like Garrett, Travis and Melody, like oh. Dave, you're sleeping on the couch, you know, yeah. and me saying what I have to sleep on the couch and yeah, you know, and it's like, Stop crying. we were in Paris and Garrett um, was jamming on the idea. Right? Yeah. I mean, that was literally, we couldn't get cabs. So amazing. And so, you know, it was like across Paris. We were in like the wrong, or, you know. It's so funny because on this podcast, they um, just produced a clip from the 2011 and he says, I was in Paris and I would get a bunch of founders to stay at an Airbnb. I'd always host everybody. And we were just jamming on ideas every night. And Garrett said, we can't get cabs. We should be like able to push a button. We should hire, yep. five, we should buy five limos, hire five yep. drivers and just do like a time sharing. Yep. People don't realize that the original idea for Uber was time sharing. So like I also time have that email. And time sharing. I literally um, have that email. Yeah. The time sharing concept. I have an email yeah. after I got back from that Paris trip from oh Travis that says, hey man, we bought these cars. Like, do you want to go in on it with us? <laughs> and I was literally broke. Yeah. I was literally broke because everyone at Facebook- should have the advisor agreement. Well, but you 10 know, basis points, this kind of shows how fast maybe you can learn something in yes. Silicon Valley. Like I didn't know anything about this stuff, like angel yeah. investing in 2008. No. Like I was still in the middle of building Facebook platform and we were, Facebook only had 50 million users. You know, we were hot, but it wasn't like this foregone conclusion. And we actually spent most of 2008 with a flatlining growth curve. Wow. And so I was like, I got my own problems. This was like the last thing I was thinking about, right? Yeah. And I was like, I can't afford to buy, like go in on half of a car right now. Yeah. You know, I can't even afford my own car, right? And I so, am now just programmed to say yes. Yeah, no. It, it, we and can. I have... I realize when you say yes as an angel investor, this will be a good segue for us. You know what you're going to lose. 50,000, 100,000, 250, 5,000, whatever it is. When you say no, you have no idea what you've lost. Yeah. Could it's be 100 crazy. million, could be a billion, could be. F it's crazy. Yeah. It's a hard but, one. <laughs> but we can't complain because you get a lot of make goods in this business. No. Yeah. I mean, let's get into it. Maybe come back to more resources for founders later, but yeah. Oh yeah, so wait, more resources. No, let's do it. Yeah, let's there was just like, you know, you, you sort of asked like, what else? I, I said that- Coach is you important. You have a coach. Um, investors you can lean on. If, yeah, investors you can lean on, but beyond that, um, you know, I've invested in some great companies. Mm. Um, Brightside is one of the ones that I did recently, which yeah. um, it does uh, digital diagnostics. So you can go on there, you take a test. Um, it figures out, you know, what your depression or anxiety level is. If you mm. are, you know, using these standardized tests in the range, then they'll uh, prescribe it for you and ship it to your door and then yeah. provide you with um, text-based and video um, oh, know, wow. therapy. So you can get 
What's the name of the it again? medication, it's Brightside. Brightside.com? Yeah. Very cool. So you can get it from afar and no stigma. Wow. You know, and we did this mostly to expand access across the whole country. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's important that people know that there's starting to be um, some really wonderful resources. Um, Get help. Yeah. I mean, that's the big thing is people have so much pride. I think our generation, we're both Gen Xers. It was kind of like there was a stigma. Yeah, oh yeah. And we were the first generation where you could be out at dinner and somebody would be like, what are you taking? It's like, I'm taking my Prozac. Yeah. And because Prozac kind of emerged yeah. in the 90s. Yep. And I remember my friends, I was like, whoa, what's that like? And they'd yep. be like, well, some days I wake up and- I'm in a fog and then some days I wake up and I want to take on the world and yeah. that's the difference. And I'm like, really? I don't get it, but okay, I don't need to get it, I guess. And now these kids, I mean, I think they want to self-medicate before they've even had the problem or even yeah. tried exercise or going yeah. for a run or going for turning off their device. Yeah, People should start with exercise, diet, yeah. and friendship, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that I say to people. Like, There's sort of a spectrum. You can be sort of negative 10, right? Like suicidally depressed, where yeah. you can be plus 10, total thriving, right? And different tools for different people. Right. But if you're way down here on negative 10, that's one thing. Make if you're a phone call. Sort of neutral, yeah, kind of sliding. And... There's some important things like eat less sugar, eat less alcohol. Sugar is one of the things that people mm. do not realize has an enormous impact on depression, anxiety, ADD. Oh. I mean, sugar, reduce the sugar. Um, I wonder Less what's alcohol. actually causing that. Is it the mania that it gives you or the dopamine? I wonder no, what the scientific- we science... could get really into the science, yeah. but it would take a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just less sugar, less alcohol, more plants in your diet. Like you yeah. don't have to get fundamentalist about, you know, Steak don't eat or meat not. or whatever. It's just more try plants, to eat more. More green. Yeah. The number one thing I tell people is yoga mm, and meditation. Like yeah. meditation, you can download apps, but if you can do yoga, if, if, if this is something you're really- really struggling with especially as a founder like yeah. start going to yoga allocate the time like yeah it's an hour hour and a half people always say i don't have time classes. for this stuff right and i always say people startups will consume all available time so design yeah. your life first for your health yeah. then let the startup consume the rest of the time yes and so like i think that's really important and yes prior prioritizing your relationship if you're married if you have a girlfriend boyfriend date nights non-negotiable right? right like make sure that your social life is built in um, and those kinds of things matter. Um, and the, maybe the last thing that I'll say is that there's a huge trend right now. Everybody is talking about psychedelics. Yeah. You know, um, you know, at Sunrise, we funded a lot of the phase two trials. Um, psilocybin. For psilocybin. Um, MDMA. Tim Ferriss and I did a lot of work around that. Yeah. Um, and these are important tools, but it's important that you use them with therapists that know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and Taking them at a rave is not Bad the proper idea. use. Yeah, and look, I'm not, I'm not going to give people life prescription, you know. But, no, but to the extent that if this is a route you want to go, all the microdo microdosing talk, all of this stuff is nonsense. Like, work with a therapist that knows what they're right. doing, especially if you're down at negative ten. Like, yeah. you know, these tools are really, really useful. They're yeah. safe. They're powerful. They're moving their way through the FDA. Yeah. But make sure you're working with a therapist. Read the that Michael know what Pollan doing. book. Yeah. A whole. Yep. A whole new mind. What is the Michael Pollan book? Um, how to change your mind. How to change your mind. Yeah. It's a great book because yeah. he's in the '60s yeah. and he embraced psychedelics yeah. at a very and he got a massive amount out of it. Yeah. And there are ketamine trials right yep. now at Stanford. Yeah. Where people who have manic depression, yep. like cannot get out of bed, yep. are at a suicidal risk. Yep. They're taking IVs. Yep. And it it's not permanent, yep. but it is alleviating them to it a works. level for weeks. Yep. Yeah, we, we sit on drips. the board of the Ketamine Research Foundation yeah. at Sunrise. Yeah. And um, my co-founder is, uh, she's a my age, our age, yeah. uh, but she spent her whole life in neuroscience at Columbia. She's yeah. one of the world experts and she's probably done more animal trials of ketamine and, you know, it really works, um, yeah. but just make sure you're working with a therapist that's doing it in the right format. Don't go to these infusion centers that are doing it like dialysis. Oh. Find a real psychiatrist that's doing ketamine assisted psychotherapy right and because um, you're adding to it the conversation the context yeah, yeah. is and then michael pollan talks really about this in his book it's super important that you go into it 
with the right expectations yes. and intentions, yes. and you're doing it in the right location, yes. with the right dose, yes. with the right person who has experience with it. This is not something to just take a handful of yes. mushrooms and go to Burning yes. Man. Yes. That's, I mean, it could be fun, sure, yes. but that's not for therapeutic persons. This is important. And yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I guess I wanted to say it here because you asked the question yeah. because this is a trend. Everyone's talking about it around sure. town. And, um, Yes, they're good tools, but make sure you're working with somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah. And don't think of it as, um, think of it as brain surgery. Like you're right. going in to do yeah. something. Um, and the other thing that I would say is, um, you know, as I've been going down this journey, one of the things that um, I was sitting in the in the back of Columbia University with the guy who invented the, or didn't he didn't invent, but he discovered the serotonin receptor. Right. And I said to him, do you think we're ever going to find a silver bullet? Yeah. And he said, no, absolutely not. Depression and anxiety are wrapped up in memory and learning. Mm. And when you think about what these things are, they are traumas, they're memories that sure. you know somebody's been dwelling on maybe for 20 years. Right, they're that not means, even aware of it. Yeah, and that means that they, not only do they have uh, software running, yeah. they have hardware. And yeah. he literally pulled out brain scans and was yeah. showing me, see these dendrites? That's yeah. like the little tentacle looking things right. in your brain. This is when your parents got in a fight. This is when you got robbed. This it's, is when your car It's literally crashed. a physical structure. Like yeah. we keep talking about the brain in Silicon Valley like it's software. Right. It's not. It's, it's software not. and hardware and electricity and chemicals, right? Yeah. And in order to actually change things, psychedelics or silent meditation retreats or any of these altered state experiences that you can do might show you your trauma. Yeah. But in order to improve it, you actually have to set to training. It's no yeah. different than running a marathon. Right. If you were going to run a marathon next week and you weren't in shape. I did it one time. It'd be not it's, fun. It's it, well, I did a five and a half hour marathon one time. I, somebody gave me their number like two weeks before. I did no training. I did one yeah. three mile run and then I did it. And you're it hurting. Most, oh my God. Right? I didn't walk for two weeks, man. It was, totally. it was super painful. You and have to change your I muscles. I puked multiple times. Right? You have to literally change the structure yes, of your muscles absolutely. and the brain's no different. Yeah. And so that's why yoga, meditation mm -hmm. like are so valuable because they actually increase your yeah. resilience just like you increase the resilience of your muscle. Yeah. And after you go through one of these experiences, you need to treat it as such that, okay, now I know my trauma. Don't keep going back to do these experiences over and over again, just to like re-experience your trauma over and over again. Well, that's it for now. Join us next time for part two, when David and Jason discuss how with some founders, success is an inevitability. And with others, they just know not to invest. Plus Dave breaks down why he thinks there's going to be two internets.